What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is December 4th of 2020. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's video, I want to spend some time to focus in on probably one of the most critical things that we need to see in cryptocurrency markets. It's the element that we're going to need to see in order for Bitcoin to maintain right below this $20,000 range and eventually break out to new all-time highs well beyond the previous highs at 20k and spark off the next cycle towards our big even levels of $100,000 to $200,000 in the next two years. So we've got a lot to talk about as well as a sponsored interview with Caleb and Brown that's going to build on this conversation of the growing institutional interest in crypto. So let's go ahead and get straight into it guys. So I want to go ahead, be straight to the point here. As you all know, I'm not one to just kind of drag on the thing into the final minute here. I want to go ahead and be clear with you all. You know, Bitcoin has been doing phenomenal here in the sense of its price. Uh, this rally has been, you know, phenomenally outpaced. Uh, it's phenomenally outpaced traditional rallies in the space. And what's interesting here is that where a lot of people were calling for 30, 40 percent correction, like we've seen historically after these kind of rallies in Bitcoin, as we've extended far away from a lot of major support ranges, at the same time we're not seeing that stark of a decline. In fact, we actually just tested up on many exchanges to all-time highs the other day back on December uh, 1st and also November 30th. So what's going on here? What's the key thing here that's going to be essential for Bitcoin to continue maintaining this momentum, hold up in this range, and eventually break out to new all-time highs? Well, it's not rocket science. It's supply and demand. I know there are a lot of headlines out there. There's a lot of people out there who are going to get you thinking that there's a dozen small factors that are, are truly driving the price. And yeah, of course, you can maybe see it that way. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, if you understand the broad perspective of how many people are willing to sell Bitcoin on the market, how many available Bitcoin are there to sell, the sell side pressure, the supply, and also how much demand there is, how much uh, you know, kind of requirement there is to buy Bitcoin on the market, no matter who it is, it doesn't really matter. It's a matter of having more demand than supply. And the important thing to understand is that there's some pretty easy ways to get a picture of this, to get an idea of it. First, let's just talk about supply here. We know Bitcoin's general supply schedule. This is going to have the biggest impact in this case around the supply side pressure of Bitcoin, because there's always people who are wanting on a day-to-day -day basis to sell Bitcoin, some maybe sell more during periods of panic or fear when prices already had some volatility or moved downward. But for the most part, the biggest supply element here is the halving event. That happens every four years. We talked about this over the last two years here on the channel, how supply and demand is really simple because you can already get an idea, generally speaking, of the supply schedule. A lot of people don't know, but the vast majority of miners, if not about half of miners, sell their Bitcoin on the open market once they mine it. A lot have to because they're running on razor thin margins for their mining business. So because of this, this causes sell side pressure. But when we go through our halving events for Bitcoin every four years, where the amount of Bitcoin issued every 10 minutes declines in half, then in this case, we have greatly reduced a lot of that minor sell side pressure. There's not as much Bitcoin to sell anymore at the current market rate. If you stay at that current market rate of, in, in regards to dollar terms, you're talking about half the dollar's worth of sell side pressure than you had to deal with before. This is phenomenal. This is great. You have less uh, than half, in this case, of the Bitcoin that was originally being sold before on the market on, on a general day, given this case. And we have to understand here that even though a lot of people say, Nick, couldn't you have priced this stuff in? Yeah, well, here's the thing, guys. If In this case, I've heard a lot of people make this argument, and it's all right. I understand some people are looking at it, and they're like, well, if this is the case that the stock to flow is eventually going to cut down to this certain finite supply, isn't it already priced in? And it's not priced in because of two major factors. One, market price for any given asset is still basically going to be driven off of what's priced in today. Markets can price in things in the future, but when it comes to the current here and now in price, it's generally determined by how many people are selling and how many people are buying in that given day. And is that an increase or decrease in the sense of supply or demand? And that's going to determine price. The second thing as well is that the vast majority of people don't understand the stock to flow model. Just like how most people who hold dollars don't understand monetary policy and how most people who own equities uh, probably don't understand all the in-depths of not only the companies they own, but also the equity market as a whole and how stocks trade or stock buybacks for that matter. No one really knows. 
most people don't know. If you're here learning about things like the stock flow model, you're an anomaly. You're a part of the 1%, and I mean that in a nice way, right? We're, we're here studying this stuff to understand how it works. A lot of people don't put this time into it, and because we're putting the time into it, we're going to come out on top a lot better than most people who are just simply speculating or investing without any kind of whim into understanding how crypto works. So we understand the supply schedule here is already benefiting here. We, again, talked about this back in May when we had the having event come through. And now it's a matter here of the second portion, demand. We need to see growing demand in the market. Now, it's not only a matter of just maintaining demand. As we want to ramp up markets here, as there will be, again, uh, more people probably selling. We see this historically as the price gets higher, more market sell side pressure comes in when people take profit. We need to see more and more buying demand. Well, so far, we've been seeing that through a mixture of different publicly traded companies, as well as financial service providers such as Grayscale with the exchange traded note GBTC. This is an over-the-counter um, uh, exchange traded note in this case that allows people to get ownership of actual shares that have real Bitcoin being backed by it. And just over the last 24 hours, they bumped up that total that they have to over 7,188 Bitcoin additionally added over the last 24 hours with a total asset under management value of $10.5 billion in crypto. The vast majority of that being Bitcoin. Take a look at this, guys. Back here from June, June in this case of this year, Grayscale went up from having a little bit over 360,000 Bitcoin. That's now up to nearly almost double of that at 500. 52. This is truly incredible stuff, guys, to see that this kind of rate of change, they're stacking tens of thousands of Bitcoin over the last 30 days. 64,832 Bitcoin. And Grayscale is not the only player. We have major companies. Again, I know it's it's like being a dead horse at this point, but you have companies like MicroStrategy that are starting to look at Bitcoin as a corporate treasure asset. The important thing here is that we're seeing Bitcoin is falling into many more types of categories of buyers that weren't previously interested in crypto. And we'll learn a little bit more of this uh, with the Caleb and Brown interview here. But again, this is the important thing to keep in mind, is that we have more buy side pressure that's outpacing the actual mining sell side pressure. Grayscale bought eight times the daily amount of Bitcoin mined in that single edition. So the only type of way that they're able to buy Bitcoin now is for people who are willing to sell it. And that is growingly scarce here. In fact, if we take a look here, if you want to just go buy it on spot exchanges, I, I'd say, of course, you can go, you could fill that order, I guess, but it's getting less and less possible. Right now, as we can see here from back at about March of 2020, the amount of Bitcoin on exchanges was around here around almost nearly 3 million, and now we're down to 2.4 million. 600,000 Bitcoin have moved off of public spot exchanges. That's incredible. That is massive in the sense of the ramifications for the actual spot price of Bitcoin. Because now institutions are coming in buying up large chunks here, and along with that as well, in this case, Bitcoin is uh, getting a lot more demand in a lot of areas that we hadn't seen before. And now we also have as well Vanek, in this case, for their EU branch, creating an exchange traded note that's serving on the Deutsche markets, in this case for Germany, and again is resembling very similarly this, uh, similarly this idea of a Bitcoin exchange traded note. It's not as flexible as an ETF. That's the important thing to understand. But at the same time, this is physically backed. And what I mean by that is that there's actual Bitcoin representing it, just like how a gold ETF would have physical gold backing it, not a paper ETF. And it's really interesting to see that this has kind of been the standard set because I think these fund managers realize that people want the real deal. They want something in this case that at least has a backing behind it, unlike the paper gold ETFs that have, you know, 100 shares uh, or more in this case per one ounce of gold that actually is supposed to back the ETFs. So... Above all, this is extremely important here to continue seeing these types of metrics, seeing the amount of Bitcoin on exchanges declining. We had a small bump up here, but the general trend has not been broken. Along with that as well, seeing more companies making large scale buying orders like this. And what's nice is that you can track a lot of this stuff on chain. We know who these players are, what addresses they use. That's how Blockport here is able to provide this chart here. And along with that, above all, it's in the headlines. So as you see more and more companies starting to come out here, it's going to be more and more confidence that overall the amount of supply of Bitcoin available to buy is drying up 
because the demand is starting to become very overwhelming. And that's the major thing that drives price, guys. It's not whales. It's not all this manipulation you see in the short term. What really drives price in the long term for any market is going to be the dynamic of buying se- buying and selling pressure. And if buying pressure is exorbitant above sell side pressure, it's going to go up. And that's why, again, I think during this period of time where we're going to consolidate sideways and at the close of the year, I don't think Bitcoin's going to sell off like people are expecting. I think we saw our correction here. Buyers came in pretty quick. And it didn't even require much volume to do so because there just isn't as much volume available on exchanges due to less and less holdings. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and dive into this interview with Caleb and Brown. I think you all are really going to enjoy it. It's really going to build on the conversation we had today. So let's go ahead and dive into the conversation with Jeff from Caleb and Brown. All right, everyone. So in today's sponsored interview, I'm sitting down with Jeff, who's one of the senior brokers over at Caleb M. Brown. He's not only a good friend of mine that I've gotten to know for a long period of time, as I've been good friends with all of you guys over at Caleb M. Brown, as you guys are offering OTC services to not only institutional clients, but also retail clients as well, aiming to provide an easy way to get into the cryptocurrency space. So Jeff, I just want to start by saying thanks for making the time, man. It's always great to have a conversation with you or Jackson or Prosh. I mean, you guys are just like an absolute gem of guys over in Australia. So I, I feel blessed to know you guys and to have you here today, man. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on. You know, uh, we've been in this space for a little while and, you know, we've been working with you as well. And then you'll be loving the and everything like that. So, yeah, it certainly is a pleasure. So thank you. Absolutely, man. So I want to go ahead and start off here real quick, because as, as always and stuff, you guys have such a great, interesting perspective as to what's going on in this space right now. I'm curious to ask you, you know, what do you think are some of the big events that happened this past year in 2020? I mean, we've been seeing all the news around PayPal as of recent, and a lot of major fintech companies starting to make big moves into the crypto space. But I'm curious about what do you think have been kind of the highlights of this year that have started to shape up the market? Because things are starting to get really interesting as a reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we found is a lot of um, a lot of those really big institutions and a lot of those uh, big companies were actually working in the shadows. So a lot of the announcements that, that we have uh, as recent information like PayPal and MicroStrategy, they, they already had this in the works over the last couple of years during our bear market. And uh, as we realized that, um, you know, over many different markets, that's, that tends to be the strategy for these guys. So it certainly... Um, you know, brings a lot of legitimacy to, to the industry. It certainly does change uh, the landscape as well. What we found is you know, over the last couple of years, especially this year as well, uh, things are coming leaps and bounds. You know, institutions like you know, PayPal and you know, as mentioned, MicroStrategy as well. Um, the biggest catalyst, I wouldn't say it's a positive one for a lot of people, but I'd say COVID definitely did open a lot of people's eyes to um, how bad things can actually get. And what we found is a lot of people now that were speaking to us that aren't typically your traditional crypto investors. Because we've spoken to crypto people through and through. I know that you're a long-term crypto vet as well. And it's become a situation now where we're speaking to people who are like, hey, you know, this isn't something I would typically look at. But, um, you know, we need to start looking at things like this now. So things are certainly evolving. And uh, it's really good to see. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. I, I think above all, like when you start to see major companies either taking, you know, sizable allocations like Square, you know, into Bitcoin at fifty million dollars uh, in a purchase, uh, you know, purchase amount, and then along with that as well, you have MicroStrategy, a publicly traded company that's going all in on Bitcoin. It's something that, if anything, it's starting to capture people's eyes and get them looking at Bitcoin as an alternative asset when treasury managers are actually starting to use Bitcoin as an asset. And one thing I think you hit on that's so true is it's not just these kind of anomalies like MicroStrategy or even emerging fintech ops. Uh, You have a lot of major brokerage platforms, uh, major financial companies, and banks themselves exploring behind the scenes either blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, or at least creating cryptocurrency investment products. This stuff doesn't happen overnight, and it takes a long time to get approval. So they try to move pretty quick on it in this case. And I think that, again, a lot of the negative sentiment that we've stereotyped would be found in traditional finance has really just been really kind of a bit of silence on on the sidelines and stuff as they've been working to prepare for this next cycle that a lot of people saw as inevitable. So I want to go ahead and like, you know, 
One thing that I think is really interesting in this case, Jeff, is, is look forward to 2021 here, because for me personally, I think 2020 was a great year. We had a lot of great development so far, obviously Bitcoin growing in price alongside a lot of other digital assets, but we also had the growth of decentralized finance, which has gotten a lot of people interested in the altcoin space as well. I'm curious to hear, like, what do you think is going to be the big catalyst uh, you know, in 2021? For me personally, I've been really interested in what's going on in the bond market. You know, bonds are a massive part of most people's pension funds or retirement uh, retirement accounts. And we now have broken a past $17 trillion in real negative yielding bonds. Uh, but that actually is a larger number if you're considering factors like inflation. And it seems like it's just going to get worse. So what's your take on that? And then also, what are some of your maybe personal catalysts for 2021 to carry us forward? Yeah, yeah, we honestly do feel that the trend will sort of continue with cryptocurrency. Uh, we do feel that we are sort of at the tip of the iceberg now uh, in terms of you know, how quickly this will move. We find uh, more and more people are going to be gaining, looking to gain exposure to these types of assets. And uh, yeah, it's, we just expect the trend to continue, honestly, because especially with things like Bitcoin um, re that reaching its previous all-time high there, um, yeah, we, we don't see anything that's going to be holding it back from there. So, Awesome. Yeah, I think in that case, uh, you know, what I, what I always kind of reference to for a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space is when I got into crypto back between late 2016, early 2017, that was around the time where Bitcoin was retesting its all-time highs or at least getting close to it. And for me, that was the moment, the moment we passed the all-time highs, even though at the time we just kind of tapped there and we started to have a bit of a correction. For me, I was like, okay, um, this is not a bubble anymore. Like this is not some speculative asset. And that's what led me to finally read the Bitcoin white paper years after I'd first heard about it uh, back in 2011. And it's amazing how much that can serve as a catalyst moment because it proves that that was just a bump in the road. And it gets a lot of people who beforehand weren't eager at all to participate or at least at least take the time to research the market. So I think in this case, I'm really curious to get a bit of insight and, and, and you're in, Jeff, from what you can tell me, of course, I understand you can't talk about everything, but I'm, I'm curious in regards to the current state of the market. Are you seeing more interest on more of the retail side or institutional side? Because I know you guys service both you with the OTC services you provide. It can work for both smaller investors and larger. But what, what's the general trends that you're seeing? To be fair, it's um, it's it's pretty interesting because we're we're starting to see you know even small, medium, and large sized businesses contact us just to say, hey, you know, we we have some cash on the side. We're not doing anything with. It's worth less all the time, every single year due to inflation. Uh, let's look for a hedge, you know? So people are actually looking to, you know, break down some of their company treasuries. We have actually been contacted recently by more, you know, small hedge funds, family offices than we ever have before. So we are certainly starting to see a lot of accumulation happening, especially in Bitcoin and Ethereum. So, yeah, we do feel that, you know, we, we may... Uh, sort of bounce around in this area for a little bit in Bitcoin, that, that could be a potential, but we do feel that there is a lot of accumulation going on behind the scenes. Awesome. And that, that's exciting to hear in this case that, you know, you kind of mentioned a lot of the, the parties that I think we're familiar with when we talk about institutional crypto, like family funds and hedge funds, they have a lot more freedom to just pretty much park capital wherever they want uh, and service, uh, you know, accredited investors. But the really interesting part here that you're talking about is this concept of corporate treasurers, um, something that I think uh, some people understand, but some people may not. It, it basically became a popular trend back in the 70s, where there was high, high rates of inflation in the United States. And because of that, companies it started to build this new position where it was like, hey, as you mentioned, we've got all this cash that originally would have been fine just parked there until we had a reason to use it. But now we've got to put that into other assets. We've got to protect our wealth in this case that you build up because you can have 10% margins as a business, but if there's 12% inflation, you're effectively losing purchasing power as an overall business. So I'm very excited to hear that you guys are getting more diversification in the sense of institutions or larger buyers. Um, what has been the sentiment as we've grown closer to 20K here, Jeff? I'm, I'm curious to hear about that because I know, again, you probably get to see a good picture of it. Are we seeing a lot more interest as we get back up to 20K or has it been kind of on the way up? We have found that the sentiment has certainly shifted very quickly, to say the least. People went from bearish to, to really, really, really bullish all of a sudden. Uh, what we're finding is a lot of investors from the previous market cycle they are still in disbelief 
a lot of these guys are still on the sidelines saying, uh, we're not sure whether this is actually a run or not. It, it, we think it definitely is. But what we found is um, a lot of the older investors, they're letting their, their psychology and, and, and what's hurt them in the past really hurt their decisions in the future. We have found a lot of the guys and a lot of people in businesses, even just small businesses, like, you know, corner store, all the way up to your institutions. Um, people who have been investing this year have done phenomenally well across, you know, a lot of DeFi assets. And obviously, you, you honestly didn't need to take on obscene amounts of risk this year to be able to get a, to, to get, fairly get a good return. You know, even just Bitcoin and Ethereum was sufficient to, to outperform a lot of other markets. Yeah, absolutely, man. I was just looking the other day and I realized, you know, Ether has basically pulled a 6x in this case. Like it went from at the bottom, uh, yeah, the sell off back in uh, back in March when everything was, pa- everyone was panicking, saying everything was over. Um, at that point, if you would have picked up Ether around $100, it's now at $600. And of course, very different environments. Everyone didn't know what was going to go on back then. But again, I think as you mentioned, people are starting to see that these are alternative hedges. And I feel bad for the people who, again, I, I can resonate with that. Like, you know, when you when you get burned in something, it takes time to feel comfortable investing back in that asset or even trading or speculating in that case. Yeah, it's yeah. So, yeah but the, you bring up a good point, Jeff. I think that those types of people who are in that mindset are the buyers who are always going to come in later in the cycle, just like they probably did last time. Um, you know, because if you're entering at this point where you're entering um, where the previous all-time highs are, historically speaking, this is pretty much a, a, a zone in this case where it, no matter how much we correct in the future, you'll still be able to bottom uh, for the end of the cycle at the bear market at a higher point from where you're buying now. Uh, so that's the really exciting thing here is that we're still in the discount range. We haven't even started hmm. to new uh, chartered to new highs. So if we hmm. multiply 5x, 10x, you know, I think that there's a lot of potential here that people really aren't factoring in. Um, but one thing I want to ask you, man, because I think, you know, one, you know, some of the people who've maybe been here during uh, the bear market over the last few years and stuff, we've done a lot of interviews here. But for those who may be uh, hearing about you guys for the first time and might not know what OTC or over the counter stands for, I just want to, you know, kind of dive in a little bit, Jeff. Like, what is it that you guys do in this case so people can understand uh, what OTC is and how it maybe differs from traditional spot exchange markets like Coinbase or Binance? That's a, that's a really good question. So we're an over-the-counter brokerage. We offer over 2,000 different digital currencies. So it's buying with US dollars, selling back into US dollars with high volumes, and uh, we do crypto swaps. We find the biggest difference between our service is, you know, like Coinbase and all those other services are great for their functions, uh, but when you need support, when you're just, for example, if you're looking at this video and you're looking to get into the market, then you're unsure <clears throat> there's a bit of a, learning curve, you know what I mean? You don't really know how to use wallets, but you have capital, but you want to exercise that capital uh, without taking on all the inherent risks. So if, you know, sending it to the wrong place or, and, and you just want consultation. Some people just want to speak to somebody, you know? So we do offer that personal brokerage service um, where you get to actually speak to a broker. We walk you through, you know, from where you, from where you are, whether you're a beginner, intermediate or, you know, full-blown uh, crypto professional. Uh, we have services and ways that we can cater for for each for each individual. So you know we can we can onboard companies, we can onboard trusts, you know, um, self directed IRAs as well. So yeah, you know, we we do have we're we're pretty much a full service brokerage, you know, when it comes to that. So it's it's kind of like using, you know, like your share trading um, application on your phone, opposed to having an actual broker and, and speaking with somebody and getting that support, getting those insights in the market. And uh, yeah, yeah, we really pride ourselves on that. Yeah, Jeff, I, I know I've, I've talked to you guys probably about this before, so I might be repeating myself. But the point I always bring up is that that's the great thing about OTC. And, and generally speaking, just being able to have customer support overall is so rare in the crypto space. It's something we do as well with my startup. Like we really focus on trying to provide customer service because it's so lacking in the crypto space, especially in the space that kind of prides the independence and decentralization, which is all great in the sense of the security or the ability to own assets and not have to trust any third parties in the process. Okay. Um, but at the same time, you know, when you're you when you need to make a big order, a sizable order, you're dealing with your retirement money, you know, in this case, when you're trying to invest in these different asset classes and 
hedge yourself. It's so great when you can get on the line with someone and just talk to them. Um, so again, I, I know that you guys have provided great service. We've had a ton of people who have said nothing but positive things about, you know, working with you guys over the last few years. And I know you guys personally, I think you guys have built a really phenomenal service and a market that really still needed, I think, that kind of professional edge uh, in order to make it a little bit more raise, uh, reasonable in this case to get exposure to crypto. So I want to say in that case, Jeff, like uh, for people who want to find out more about you, what are some of the links that uh, people should go to? And if guys, if you're interested uh, by checking out a little bit more about Caleb and Brown, I'll leave them down below in the description so you guys can learn more. But what would be the best place for them to go to, Jeff? Yeah, just jump on our website. It's calebandbrown.com. And look, there's an inquiry page. There's a chat box. If you have any questions, feel free to come through and say hello. Um, we're all friendly people. We're out here, based out here in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, yeah, we look forward to, to speaking to, to people who are sitting on the sidelines who are uh, not quite sure yet. They kind of need a, a bit of help. Uh, and that's what we're here to do. You know, we want to make sure that everyone can have an equal opportunity, safe access and entry to the market. A lot of people, they, they think carefully about how they're going to enter, but they don't think about you know, how they're going to exit as well. So it's, uh, it's really important. Absolutely, Jeff. I mean, honestly, you guys have done a phenomenal job over the last few years. And I can say above all, I know it's a bit out of the talk of crypto, but I hope I get to come see you guys soon in Melbourne. It's a beautiful place and you guys have built a wonderful company. And I can't wait to see all the new faces you guys have added as well. I, I know you guys have grown a bit since I last talked with Prash and stuff. So hats off to you guys and all the growth. And we'll have to have you back on the channel again soon, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. You know, it's been a couple of years since you've uh been out here we, we look forward to having you out here again and uh yeah let's absolutely. uh let the, bull, let the bulls run <laughs> <laughs> absolutely man take care thank you appreciate it